All right, good morning, everybody. My name is John Paul Ruiz, Director of Professional Development here at the Entrust Group, and welcome to the webinar, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, What's Changed for Retirement Plans and Why It Matters. Now, this is not a comprehensive uh, seminar that will cover all the details about the changes that were derived from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, but it we will try to cover most of the highlights of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act pertaining to how it affects you as a retirement plan investor. It is still best to seek the assistance of a competent tax or legal advisor in regards to dealing with the specifics of your own uh, uh, tax situation. Now, again, a little bit of a disclaimer. The interest group does not provide investment advice or endorse any type of products. All the information materials are purely for educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged, again, to consult with your tax attorney, accountants, uh, financial advisors, um, before entering into any type of investment or if you have any sort of uh, direct uh, specific um, tax questions about your uh, specific situation. Now, it is 2018, and this is when most of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions um, take effect. That's why we've decided to revisit this particular uh, webinar and present it to you again so that you we can raise up those issues that um, that you might want to be aware of when it comes to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Okay. The agenda for today's uh, webinar uh, deal, will deal with the effects of the personal deductions and marginal tax rates on making IRA contributions and taxation of distributions, uh, the opportunity for employers to make retirement plan contributions, uh, the repeal of recharacterizations of what we call conversions. Now, the repeal of recharacterizations for contributions uh, is, um, uh, has not taken effect. In other words, contributions can still be recharacterized. Uh, the main um, repeal that has occurred is the repeal of recharacterizations of conversions. Um, the change in the penalty exemption for medical expenses when distributing assets from uh, a retirement plan, as well as the addition of elementary and secondary schools with a limit of 10000 on 529 plans. And then we'll open up the phone lines for any questions you may have uh, in regards to the material, and, and hopefully those are the types of questions that we can answer for uh, during this particular webinar. All right. <clears throat> A uh, little bit about the Antrust Group. The Antrust Group has been around for over 37 years, uh, focusing mainly in the alternative investment world. Uh, what that means is that um, not only you know can you offer stocks, bonds, mutual funds in retirement plans, other types of investments beyond what is not allowed. What, what does that mean? There are only two different types of investments that are not allowed in the IRA world, as an example. And those are your life insurance contracts, in other words, term life, as well as collectibles. Any other type of investment uh, basically should be available as long as it does not incur what we call a prohibited transaction. Most custodians out there will not hold other types of investments, such as real estate, notes, um, private placements, as an example, because they don't have the infrastructure to support that. The interest group mainly um, focuses our services on record-keeping uh, alternative investments. In other words, those real estate notes, uh, private placements, even precious metals that are allowed to be held under a retirement plan. We have our leader in the industry, and what delineates us from a lot of the record-keepers out there is our education component. Our staff is knowledgeable uh, and um uh, uh, we'll be more than happy to engage with a conversation with any investor that has general questions in regards to the alternative investment world. However, when it, become, when it comes to specifics about your own particular situation, again, it is good to uh, uh, you know, consult with your own tax or legal advisor. Um, not only do we educate our own staff in regards to the alternative investment world, we actually also educate other professionals in the industry not only in a self-directed world, but also banks, uh, credit unions, uh, broker-dealers, um, attend what we call our IRA Academy. Our IRA Academy is a, a week-long school that uh, investment professionals or retirement plan professionals can attend and prepare themselves to um, 
take what we call the Certified IRA Services Professional Designation, which is a designation through the American Banking Association. Now, our courses are also approved for continuing education courses for multiple designations, uh, national designations uh, in the country. Now, let's, let's get down to the material and what we're going to be covering regards to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The main three factors that, um, that uh, typically determine an individual's taxable income uh, for 2017 is what we're going to use as the basis of comparison to what changed in 2018. One of the main uh, objectives of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is to cut the level of taxation most Americans pay by changing the, the way we determine what's taxable. And uh, there are typically three factors that are involved in calculating what's taxable in 2017. And those factors are the adjusted gross income of an individual, which is um, a gross, the gross income of an individual adjusted, of course, of any 401k contributions, as an example, cafeteria plan contributions, Section 125 contributions, uh, HSA contributions, uh, even employer plan contributions for self-employed individuals, or in other words, uh, individuals that are entrepreneurs that work for themselves. Those employer plan contributions are actually used as a tax deduction that reduces an individual's gross income, which determines the adjusted gross income of an individual. The second factor that's typically used by individuals in 2017 is one of the two. In other words, the greater of the two. It's either a standard amount that the IRS provides that allows an individual to be able to uh, uh, lower down their tax, further lower down their taxable income by a specific amount, or if an individual can list the different types of expenses that they had for the year that's allowable as a deduction, of course, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to pick the larger one of the two. That is what we call itemized deduction. In other words, you have to compare the standard deduction or the itemized deduction to, de to determine what, will, what amount they can use to further reduce their taxable income. And last but not least, personal exemptions. Depending upon the number of dependents you have in your household, that amount was typically multiplied by a certain dollar figure. And it was around 4,050 in 2017 for uh, dependents. In other words, a family of four, it's around 16,000. That will further reduce the taxable income of the individual. And from there, the taxable income is taxed at different rates, which means it's taxed at different brackets, is what a lot of people would call it, or marginal tax rates. Well, the 2018 tax cuts, I'm sorry, for 2018, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that's effective in 2018 affected all three, three factors that determine taxation. And we're going to go through the first one first. And the first one is what we call uh, the adjusted gross income. The adjusted gross income uh, was affected based of the, from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that will affect um, sole proprietors, in other, or, or in, other, in other words, uh, businesses that are small businesses, in other words, entrepreneurs. Given the fact that C corporations reduced a lower taxation rate, um, lowering it down from generally the highest rate of 39% to 21% to 2018, sole proprietors, partnerships that uh, typically are not taxed as the cor the cor under the corporate rates, will receive close to the same benefit by possibly receiving a 20% tax deduction based out of their qualified business income. Now, qualified business income constitutes income that is derived from a trade or a business. Now, this is where your uh, competent tax or legal advisor uh, will come into play because they're the ones that typically assist and walk you through the different types of incomes. There are other types of incomes that may be um, uh, uh, allowable or may, be, may benefit from the 20% tax deduction that we're talking about, income from REITs and other specific types of income. But generally, income that is, from a, um, that is derived from a trade or a business uh, that is within the allowable amount may, be, uh, may constitute a 20% tax deduction on the individual's tax return 
when they filed their tax return for the tax year 2018. Now, there are certain types of businesses that are, are excluded from this particular benefit. However, if their income falls below certain thresholds, it really doesn't matter. They're, they're, um, they will be uh, allowed to, to avail of this particular benefit. And these are the, the types of businesses. Uh, fields in, the, in health, law, engineering, architecture, accounting, financial services, brokerage services, or consulting. But however, again, these limitations of the type of business uh, will not apply as long as their qualified business income falls below certain thresholds. If it's a single filer, if it's below 157500 and if it's for a married couple filing a joint tax return, if it's below 315000 that it doesn't matter if they're uh, part of the list of the businesses that are typically excluded. They will still be able to avail of this particular uh, additional tax deduction under 2018 tax return. Now, you might ask, what, what, um, what happens if it's over 157500 well, uh, if it's above 157,500, uh, you can still possibly get a portion of the 20% tax deduction. In other words, you're not going to get the full 20%. You might get 18 or 15, so on and so forth, depending upon the amount of income that you have. For single filers, it'll be phased out at 207,500, an additional 50,000. But as as the income increases again, it phases out that percentage incrementally. Now, for a married couple filing a joint tax return, the phase out range is around 100,000. So, in other words, it's at 415,000. Another example of that would be if if a person uh, makes 350,000, they won't get the full 20% tax deduction, but they will get a percentage of that tax deduction. Uh, that still, you know, that that can still lower down the taxable income of the individual who is a sole proprietor partnership that's declaring. Uh, income for the particular year. Now, why does that have anything to do with the retirement plans? Well, some individuals um, who contribute to a retirement plan, and if they're a business that has a trade or a business type of income, and what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I mean, what I mean by that is that it's not passed through income. I got a question uh, the other day, is that some, some, some individuals said, well, I own rental properties and I receive rent. Does, does that affect me? The answer would be no, it will not affect you because rental income is what we call passive income, and it's not considered a trade or business when reporting that income to the IRS. That's reported as um, passive income on a Schedule E. It's called rents and royalties. So, therefore, that is not considered as a trade or business. If you have any questions in regards to the, the income that you receive, that's a good question to your tax advisor. Based on the income or, you know, if you have any questions in regards to the categorization of that income, yeah, that's a good question that you tax advisor to see if you could avail of that additional 20% tax deduction for these types of businesses. A retirement plan contribution that is made on behalf of the employer and in some cases maybe even employees reduces the individual's qualified business income. In other words, you may be uh, you may fall under one of the categories that I mentioned that are excluded from availing of this 20% deduction. But by contributing to a retirement plan, it may reduce the income enough to allow for that um, employer to be able to avail of the the uh, the 20% tax deduction. As an example, a SEP contribution, a simplified employee pension plan retirement plan contribution has a maximum of the lesser of 25% of income or um, 55000 for 2018. $55,000 can reduce an, individ an individual's income uh, substantially as long as their income will support the, making that amount of a contribution. Again, by making a retirement plan contribution, that could reduce the individual's qualified business income to avail of this 20% tax deduction. Again, uh, talk to your tax advisor in regards to this particular uh, tax deduction, and you might want to have a conversation with them to run the numbers to see if a, an employer-sponsored plan contribution uh, may affect the QBI, or qualified business income, that will determine whether or not your business is eligible for this 20% tax deduction. 
Now, small business QBI determination is determined by the Schedule C for a sole proprietor. Uh, partnerships is the IRS Form 1065, and for S corporations, it's 1120S. The deductions for individuals are uh, are, are put on on the the new schedule, Schedule One for the IRS Form 1040, as a part of the uh, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2018 tax return, uh, modified a little bit the IRS Form 1040, which created six different schedules that could be attached to the IRS Form 1040. And Schedule One is what you would look at. On line 28 of the Schedule 1 is where the self-employed SEP simple or qualified plan contributions can be entered in to reduce the adjusted gross income of an individual to determine whether or not they have, uh, you know, they have a QBI that would qualify for that 20% deduction. Again, for, for sole proprietors, it would be the um, Schedule C. For partnerships, it would be 1065. And then for S Corps, the 1120S. And again, the amount of the contribution is reported on line 28 of Schedule 1. That is an attachment or a schedule attached to the IRS Form 1040. And that's how uh, retirement plan contributions could affect uh, an individual's income for the year. With the increased profits uh, because of the lower taxation, um, there may be opportunity for businesses to infuse either capital to, to grow their business or make retirement plan contributions again. You know, instead of paying Uncle Sam the amount of taxation for higher tax rates in previous years, if you have a little bit of a, a difference in amount, why not make that as a, a retirement plan contribution to further reduce the QBI and in some cases may even allow individuals to further reduce their income to make themselves available for that additional 20% deductions. Um, small businesses historically prioritize taxes, ver taxes ver versus making retirement plan contributions. This is a great opportunity with the change in the tax law to actually have some money to make retirement plan contributions. Now, let, I'm going to go off tangent a little bit. Why is a retirement plan contribution important, not only for tax deduction purposes, but uh, according to the Employee Benefits Research Institute, they say that there are typically three different sources of income, income an individual is going to count on for retirement. One is an employer-sponsored plan, which around 18 to 42 percent of an individual's income for during retirement is supposed to come from an employer-sponsored plan, and and, and number two, uh, 36 percent is supposed to come from Social Security. Last but not least, around 48 percent should come from personal savings. Well, there is already a deficit in most cases on the three different buckets that I'm talking about. So let's take a look at small business retirement plan contributions. A lot of small businesses out there are focused on growing their business and banking on the fact that if the business is successful enough, that that would be a source of their retirement. But unfortunately, not all businesses make it. But if you do have a good year and you do have um, cash that could – expendable cash that uh, is um, – you know, that increased profits, whether it be by reduced taxation or you just had a good year – Retirement plan contributions are a good way to shelter from taxation. Some of the income that you receive, because there are limitations, of course, of what you can contribute, these contributions can be put in an account for yourself for the future, and that contribution is allowed to be used as a tax deduction from your tax return. So in other words, you know, all, out of the three sources of income, it's a, good, it's a good strategy or a tool to bank away dollars now so that you'll have at least a bucket that you can tap into when you retire. Self-employed individual employer plan contributions are deductible again on your own personal income taxes. That's again on Schedule 1 of the IRS Form 1040 that will reduce your AGI and could possibly make an individual uh, avail of that additional 20% uh, tax deduction. But again, you got to run a number. So those are some things that you might want to sit down with your tax advisor that could further reduce your taxable income for the year. Now let's take a look at the second category of, of reductions from the taxable income that will further, you know, that, that will allow for an individual to further reduce the amount of tax they're going to they're gonna have to pay. Standard deductions versus itemized deductions. There have been some changes under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in regards to the standard deductions as well as the itemized deductions. Let's take a look at first the uh, standard 
versus itemized deductions. Now for 2017, the standard uh, deduction for a single file was 6,350. Head of household was 9,350. For joint filers, it's around 27. Uh, I'm sorry, 12,700. For 2018, the standard deductions were almost doubled, which means that you know, based out of the adjusted gross income, an individual could further reduce their income by almost double the amount that they would have been able to. Um, uh, reduce their taxable income in 2017. In other words, by um, by almost twice what they would have done in 2017. Now, uh, keep in mind, this is exciting for some, some people that actually use the standard deduction because they don't itemize their deduction. In other words, in some cases, they may not have any state tax to deduct or they don't have mortgage interest that is um, deductible. In some cases, those people who itemize in 2017 may even want to avail of the standard deductions given the fact that it has increased because their itemized deductions may not amount to the amount of the doubled stand, almost doubled standard deductions available in 2018. Again, you've got to run the numbers. Talk to your tax or legal advisor whether it be it's better to use the standard deduction or to, to use the itemized deductions. Given the fact that there's some changes to the standard deductions, there are also some changes to the itemized deductions. Depending upon the state that you live in, in other words, some states don't have state income taxes, which is typically tax deductible on uh, Schedule A that is attached to the IRS Form 1040. You know, um, some states that actually um, have state income tax, like California, where the interest group is is at. Um, well, if you don't have state income tax, again, you might want to use a standard deduction. But if you do, you might want to still take a look at it. Why is that? Because state and local taxes that typically did not have a cap to it uh, now have a cap. It's called SALT, so, uh, state and local taxes deduction. It is capped at 10000 whereas some people used to use the state and local uh, taxes that they used to pay as a deduction uh, if, if it's over ten thousand, well, now you're going to be capped at, you know, now you're going to be capped at ten thousand. So if you paid fifteen thousand total, well, you're going to be capped at ten thousand. So you're going to have to look for some other places to um, be able to reduce your taxable income. And again, if you're a sole proprietor or, you know, in other words, an entrepreneur, making a making a, a contribution to a retirement plan may be a good way to reduce your your income further to, again, lower down the amount of tax that you'll have to pay. Um, home equity lines of credit, HELOCs, interest can no longer be used as a tax deduction if it wasn't used to upgrade your home. In other words, if you used your uh, home equity line of credit to pay down debt, pay down credit cards, those those amounts, the interest on that uh, particular uh, type of uh, uh, line of credit can no longer be used uh, as the interest on that cannot be used as a tax deduction any longer. Um, amount paid towards medical expenses um, has, has, has a change, but it's a good change. Whereas in 2017, only uh, medical expenses that are above 10% of the adjusted gross income can be used as a tax, as a tax deduction. For 2018, the adjusted gross income percentage was lowered back down to seven and a half percent seven and a half percent of the adjusted gross income so any amount above that can be used as a um, as a tax deduction on an individual's tax return so in other words if you have fifteen thousand dollars of um, uh, medical insurance you know you had an emergency or whatever it may be you got to multiply your adjusted gross income by 10% in 2017, and you can only deduct up to the level that's above a 10% of your adjusted gross income you use it as a tax deduction. For 2018, you just multiply the adjusted gross income by 7.5%. In other words, you'll be able to use more of your um, medical expenses as a deduction if you itemize your deduction on a Schedule A. Another big thing about the Schedule A is the fact that uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you have health insurance and you can't deduct all of your health insurance premiums 
on your IRS Form 1040, which, by the way, you know, um, entrepreneurs, self-employed individuals are allowed to use the, um, the premiums that they paid towards health insurance as a tax deduction. But if your income is not as much uh, as the amount of premium that you paid, you can actually use a portion of that as a medical expense on your Schedule A. So you might something that you might want to talk to your tax advisor as well in regards to what's more beneficial for you uh, to use it as a tax deduction on your 1040 or you include that in your itemized deductions um, uh, in, on your Schedule A in your IRS Form 1040. Amount of charitable contributions that were also given to uh, charitable entities used to have a, um, uh, a cap at 50% of the um, of the income of an individual that has increased to 60% of income. In other words, if you really want to, you know, what you really want to give away a lot more uh, uh, charitable contributions uh, to your church or whatever it may be, it used to be capped at 50%. Now, the income is capped at 60%. Now, keep in mind, the qualified charitable distributions from retirement plans uh, are still in effect. That up to $100,000 of taxable distributions from retirement plans. Um, can be tax-free if it's paid directly to a qualified charitable institution. And, of course, the individual must be at least 17 and a half or older. In other words, you're taking your required minimum distributions. For these individuals, you can take up to $100,000 of taxable retirement plan assets, gift it to charity, fully tax-exempt. What we're talking about here in the, in the charitable contributions is if you, you know, again, you pay tithe to your church or whatever it may be, that amount typically has a cap of 50% of your uh, income, but that has been increased to 60%. Now, keep in mind again, check with your tax advisor um, in regards to what your situation is, and but at least you know approach it with having a little bit of knowledge on what has changed. Others, unreimbursed uh, employee expenses and other miscellaneous deductions, theft, and personal casualty losses, certain ca casualty losses, and in federally uh, declared disaster areas may still be claimed as a deduction. Now, elimination of historical uh, deductible items such, such as state taxes and home equity lines of credit, uh, state taxes again of a cap of uh, 10,000 and then HELOC interest uh, if it's not used for you know for your home again if it's for other purposes may no longer be used as a as a taxable deduction. An individual may want to consider, again, making a retirement plan contribution as a means of reducing your taxable income because you can no longer deduct those, uh, you may no longer deduct uh, certain interests, again, as well as uh, certain levels of state income tax that is above around 10000 Increasing 401k deferrals in your employer-sponsored plan may be a, a, something that you might want to consider. If you're a small business and you don't have health insurance, uh, you might want to um, establish or uh, set yourself up a high-deductible health plan because HSA contributions, health savings account, account, health savings account contributions that can go towards the, the you know, deductible for that high-deductible health plan are straight-line deductions on the IRS Form 1040. And again, last but not least, again, making, uh, making a, a small business plan contribution to a SEP or maybe a simple, maybe a strategy uh, to offset those um, uh, lost deductions available for state taxes and uh, home equity lines of credits. Uh, and I, I hope you're, you're writing those down. We're, we're going to open up the phone lines later on for any questions you may have. So ju just bear with me. So keep those questions, uh, you know, uh, write down those questions, and we'll op when, when, we, we, when we have the Q&A portion, we, we'll try to answer any questions you may have, okay? All right. Personal exemptions. Personal exemptions typically was a great means of lowering down your taxable income in 2017. Again, family of four, it's around 16200 But for 2018 to 2025, given the fact that the standard deductions were doubled, they felt that it was okay to go ahead and forego the personal exemptions for tax years 2018 and 2025. So if you're counting on 
uh, using your dependents, the number of your dependents, as further reducing your taxable income by using the personal exemptions, that will not be available in 2018. So therefore, uh, you might want to look at other ways to be able to reduce your taxable income to pay the least amount of tax that you'll have to pay. There are certain um, changes uh, to the personal exemptions that may benefit individuals that have what we call qualified children for the, the child tax credit. In other words, the individual must be under the age of uh, 17, and you must fall within certain income levels. And that, that um, child tax credit has, been in, has increased for 2018. That might be something you might want to check with your tax advisor. Again, that could, um, you know, if, you, if you're eligible for that and you qualify for that. Empty nesters, however, in other words, your kids are gone, uh, that will not be a, a means of uh, benefiting you from a tax perspective. Okay, one of the big, now that we've covered the, the three different components that determine taxable income, one, again, is your adjusted gross income reduced by 401k contributions, cafeteria plan contributions, as an example, or if you're an entrepreneur, retirement plan contributions, that first reduction is, is uh, um, one of the things that reduces your taxable income for the year. The next one is either your standard or itemized deduction. I didn't, there are some changes in the standard deduction. Again, it's double that, almost doubled from 2017. Or if you itemize, uh, there have been some changes on what you could use as a tax deduction when you itemize your your um, deductible expenses. So that would be something to take a look at. And last but not least, the personal exemptions is no longer is not available from 2018 to 2025. So you might want to take a look at other means of offsetting or lowering or offsetting that amount by another type of allowable deduction, such as a retirement plan contribution. The second change of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are the changes in the marginal tax rates. Whatever's left over after the two, de two reductions for 2018, it used to be three again, now it's only two. Whatever, the change, whatever is left over after reducing the gross income, whatever the, whatever the taxable income is, will be taxed at different brackets. What you're looking at is a comparison of the 2017 and compared to comparison to the 2018 uh, tax brackets. All right. Historically, if you're in a 10% tax bracket um, or even a portion of your income, and that 10% tax bracket has no change. Where the change occurs is the next level of income. The next level of income, which typically is taxed at 15%, is now taxed at 12%. The 25% is taxed at 22%. The 28% is taxed at 24%. That's a pretty pretty big uh, um, change. 33% to 32%. 33 to 35% is taxed at 35%. 39.6% is taxed at 37%. So if you're in the highest marginal tax rate and your level of income on that on that uh, level is taxed at 39.6%, now you're taxed at 37%. And what this means is that, de depending upon your level of income, a portion of your income uh, up to a certain level is taxed at 10%. Uh, a certain portion of your level of income above that particular threshold is taxed at 12%, uh, and so on and so forth. If you want to see the tax tables uh, <clears throat> for 2000. 18. In other words, what 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 thresholds um, go from you know zero to ten, and then from from ten to twelve? Google uh, 2018 tax tables, and that'll tell you the income thresholds that that are, delineate a single filer, a married couple filing a joint tax return, and and or a single head of household filer. Not all of your income that's left over is taxed at one rate. It is taxed again at different rates depending upon the level of the income that you're looking at. The first level again is 10, and that second level is 12, 22, 24. The more income you have, the higher level of income is taxed at a higher rate. All right? Again, that's what that means. The marginal tax rates were reduced. Let's take a look at the effects of the new tax law. Let's take a look at a single filer that has gross income of 60000 
The individual participates in an employer's uh, health plan, which is a cafeteria plan, and contributes to an HSA and a 401k plan. It's just typical, an individual. The individual has an adjusted gross income of 52000 How do we get to 52? Because the individual contributes to um, uh, the health plan, which reduces the gross income, and also contributes to an HSA and a 401k plan through the employer's cafeteria plan, which, again, makes the individual's adjusted gross income, in this case, an example, at 52000 Now, Now, we're not going to cover the... the, the, the the specific dollar figures we're just using is for theoretical principle purposes. The individual is not uh, eligible for the tax savers credit because it's a single filer. They don't have any children. So this is how it would look uh, compared from 2017 to 2018. Same AGI, let's say 52,000. The standard deduction in 2017 was 6,350. In 2018, it's 12,000. However, the individual is eligible for the personal exemption in 2017, but given the fact that the personal exemption has been eliminated in 2018, so therefore there's no deduction for that. The taxable income of the individual for 2017 would have been 41,600. The taxable income in 2018 will be 40,000. Thus, even though the personal exemption was eliminated, the individual will still have a lower taxable income for the year. Now, let's take a look at how much tax will this individual have to pay. Now, for 2017, the, 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 at the 10% rate, it'll be at $952.50. Okay, that's, the, that's the first level uh, of taxation for a single filer. Given the factor from zero to 9520 uh, it's taxed at 10%. That's where we get the $952 at that rate. The 15% bracket, however, has been reduced to 12%. So let's do a comparison of that. The 15% tax bracket in 2017 would have resulted in a $4,811 uh, tax liability. So you add the 952 plus 4811, the individual would owe a total amount of taxes of 5763 However, for 2018, given the fact that the 15% tax rate has been reduced to 12 where the 952 is still the same, the 12% will now yield a $3,657 tax, which constitute in a lower uh, total tax in 2018. The individual would have a tax savings of $1,154.25. So, again, with the changes in the standard deduction, uh, as well as the changes in the bracket system, for this particular example, the individual actually... Um, I save some, some money from a tax perspective. Let's take a look at example two, but but in this case, the child has the I'm sorry, the individual has one child, so therefore they're eligible for the tax credit, tax savers credit. The single filer again has sixty thousand dollars of income with one child. The employee again participates in the same types of plans. Adjusted gross income is fifty two thousand. But however, this individual has a a child that is eligible for the tax credit. The child tax credit has been increased from uh, $1,000 to $2,000 per eligible child, with up to $1,400 of the child tax credit eligible for a refund. So in other words, it doubles the child tax credit from $1,000 to $2,000. Let's see um, how this would affect the individual's um, uh, taxable income. First, again, AGI, you know, 52000 uh, minus 18 as a standard deduction. Personal exemption is eliminated. The taxable income is 34,000 in comparison to 34,500 for 2017. Now let's take a look at the changes in the marginal tax rates. Marginal tax rates again. Um, uh, the, the the tax on 10% has no savings because it both remains at, at 10%. 1,360. However, in the 15% tax bracket, instead of 15%, now it's 12%, the individual saves around $732 because of the 3% difference. The total tax is uh, $3,808 for the individual. Now, with the child tax credit, 
that 3,808 will be reduced by a number of 2,000 instead of 1,000 from the previous year. That will constitute a substantial tax savings for that individual of $1,707. As you can see, again, I'm rattling off a lot of these numbers, but here's some examples of individuals that actually um, benefited from the changes in the tax law and running the numbers can tell the individual how much of a tax savings that they would have received based on, again, the changes in a particular tax law. A recap, most people will be paying less tax. Not all of them, because uh, you, if you run the numbers, some people actually would not have availed of the, uh, uh, the benefits of, of, of paying less tax. It, it, in other words, for, in some cases, it may be just a straight line or in some cases, depending upon the numbers and what they're eligible for, it may not even be a tax break for them. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act does affect a lot of Americans um, that fall under the category of, you know, you're having a qualifying child for the tax credit, uh, as well as individuals that typically do not itemize their deduction. Very beneficial. More individuals may consider contributing to their retirement plans. Why is that? Because um, contributing to retirement plans, as you saw in the 401k plan, is a, is, it, reduces your adjusted, uh, it reduces your adjusted gross income because that amount is not declarable. The amounts contributed to a retirement plan are not declarable as taxable income for a particular year, especially for entrepreneurs who are looking for that additional tax break. You might want to consider contributing to a SEP or a SIMPLE. Um, the reduced taxation may also increase the feasibility of conver converting traditional IRAs or distributing 401k plans that are eligible to be distributed and converting it into a Roth type of account. Given the fact that if, if um, a taxpayer actually has some tax savings, now they have some, some uh, taxes that they would have maybe prepaid that they may get as a refund, they might, might want to backtrack with those numbers to possibly convert some of their traditional IRA assets, pay the tax on that, and put it in a Roth, and use that, that tax savings as a means of paying for the, the taxation of the conversion. Again, the tax savers credit is not eliminated, which uh, means further tax savings for lower-income uh, Americans that may want to avail of additional, an additional tax credit by contributing to a retirement plan. All right. Now let's move on to additional uh, changes according to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Recharacterizations of conversions. Uh, what is a recharacterization? If an individual decides to convert their traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, as an example, or if they have 401k assets and they've received a, or they met a distributable event, in other words, they can take a distribution from their 401k plan, well, those assets could actually be what we call converted to a Roth. Uncle Sam says if you pay the tax on those distributions from either one of the accounts and put it in a Roth IRA, number one, depending upon how old you are, well, actually, it doesn't matter how old you are, the 10% penalty for that distribution, if you're under the age of 59 and a half, will be waived. In other words, you'll only have to pay the tax. That amount can be contributed to a Roth in what we call a conversion. Now, keep in mind, again, the, the focus of this particular uh, example is the fact that somebody's going to get taxed. What if an individual does a conversion and eventually says, you know what, I don't want to have, I don't have to pay the tax. I can't afford it. Well, Uncle Sam in the past used to say, well, just take it back out of the Roth and put it back to whatever plan, in this case a traditional IRA, and let's call it even. There's no taxation. Just put it back in a traditional and undo your particular conversion. That transaction is what we call a recharacterization. The change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminates this particular uh, provision. In other words, if you do a conversion in 2018, you can no longer recharacterize that conversion. However, recharacterizations of... Uh, Current year contributions. In other words, you contribute to a traditional, you want to put it in a Roth. Uncle Sam says you can still do that by your tax return due date plus extensions. What they eliminated is the, re is the recharacterization of a conversion starting in 2018. In other words, you can no longer, let's say you, let's say you converted 100 grand. Well, 
too bad, so sad for 2018, Uncle Sam is saying, you cannot undo that conversion. You're going to have to pay the tax uh, on that additional $100,000 that you took as a distribution and converted to a Roth. You can no longer recharacterize it. Um, again, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act repealed, uh, repealed the recharacterizations of conversions, and annual contributions can still be recharacterized. If you have any questions, again, in regards to what I'm going through, I'm going pretty fast on this because this is the second time that we've uh, presented this particular seminar. Please, jot your questions down, and we will be more than happy to answer it for you moving forward. We're almost done here. So uh, another change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, although 529 plans and covered L education savings accounts are not retirement plans, um, they still have the same tax treatment when it comes to tax deferment of earnings and possibly tax redistribution of these earnings if used for certain purposes. A 529 plan is a state-ran program that allows an individual taxpayers to contribute to whatever the maximum is for that state because each state has a different maximum amount. Uh, those are typically used for higher level education. In other words, college, university, both tax school that's uh, eligible to receive federal aid. However, the change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act allows for distributions from 529 plans of up to $10,000 and to be used for elementary and secondary schools. In other words, uh, it's no longer restricted wholly for colleges and you know universities, in other words, higher level earning, higher level institutions learning. Uh, they included elementary and post-secondary schools, uh, up to 10,000 in that, and um, which you know, comes to mind, what about the Coverdale Education Savings Account? Because that was the big difference between a Coverdale and a 529 plan. Uh, 529 plans were limited to higher level education. Coverdale, you can use it for elementary and secondary schools. Well, that kind of puts a damper in the Coverdale Education Savings Account because, again, up to $10,000 a year can be distributed from 529 plans now for elementary and secondary education. Big change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Let's walk you through miscellaneous retirement plan changes. There are some um, uh, areas that are affected by uh, national calamities. Victims of um, a, federally disaster, a federally declared disaster area uh, may distribute from employer plans, including uh, 401k plans, 403b governmental, 457b plans, as well as IRAs and receive relief. The maximum amount that qualifies is up to 100000 Um It only applies to distributions between January 1st of 2016 and January 1st, 2018. Um, and the, um, uh, the benefit is they can spread out the tax payment of the distribution ratably, or in other words, in this case, over a three-year period. The amounts also may be, uh, th that are distributed may be uh, rolled over within a three-year period of time. Now, keep in mind, those assets that are they're going to be uh, rolling back in in three years have um, already been taxed. So if it's already been taxed, well, the assets that are being rolled back in have been taxed already. If you're going to roll it back in, you might want to consult with your tax advisor on how to keep track of those assets that have been taxed. Typically, it's tracked using an IRS form. 8606. Now, the 10% penalty is waived for this particular distribution for uh, uh, affected under the Louisiana Storms uh, disaster. Um, another benefit for retirement plans, not mainly individual retirement arrangements, is that if an individual um, is forced to take a distribution of a loan that they had in a 401k plan, typically what they have is what we call a loan offset. In other words, you can come up with the difference out of pocket and roll it back in within 60 days. Now, let me give a little bit more of an of a explanation of what that means. Individuals who participate in a 401k plan can take a loan of the, the lesser of 50% of their vested balance, not to exceed 50000 and typically, employers require that the repayment of that loan be paid back using what we call a payroll deduction. In other words, it's going to be debited from their paycheck to pay back that loan. That typically, the amortization for that particular loan type of arrangement is typically five years. And the only way it could be extended beyond five years if the loan was to purchase a primary residence. 
However, if an individual quit prior to that five-year loan accrual or, or amortization being fulfilled, well, how, how is an individual going to make a payment when you don't have a payroll anymore from that employer? So therefore, most employers will say, if you're going to take a distribution, that that loan will be distributed in what we call a loan offset. In other words, you can roll that amount over into an IRA, but what amount are you going to be able to roll over? The employer says, well, I'll report that as if it was a normal or premature distribution from this retirement plan, but it's up to you to make up the funds within a 60-day period. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act extended that 60-day period for these particular types of arrangements called a loan offset up until the tax payers' tax return due date plus extensions. In other words, not only do they have 60 days now, they actually have until their tax return due date plus extensions to make up that cash so that they don't get taxed on that loan balance, which was distributed from, a, from, a, from an employer plan. Now, again, they still have to come up with the cash, but they have a, a longer period of time. The 10% penalty exemption for medical expenses. In other words, if an individual takes a distribution from a retirement plan, which is typically subject to a 10% penalty, if that distribution was used to pay medical expenses, uh, Uncle Sam says any portion of that, any any distribution that was used to pay towards the medical expenses that are above seven and a half percent of an individual's adjusted gross income will be exempt from a ten percent penalty. In other words, you had a lot of medical expenses, and your medical expenses exceed seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income. So the amount that is above 7.5% can be distributed from an IRA, not subject to a penalty, as, and it's, if it's paid towards those medical expenses, that again, amount, that amount is not subject to the 10% um, 10 penalty. That 7.5% again used to be 10% 2017, again, lowered back down to 7.5% to in 2018. All right. In summary, uh, the tax law change may have, uh, benefit most Americans, especially those who do not itemize. The non-availability of the personal exemption may not be beneficial for some taxpayers. If you have large families, uh, you know, given the fact that you know some of the exemptions you may have may be for children that are not eligible for the child tax credit, that might not benefit uh, some some families. Uh, anymore because the exemption was a, a, a dramatic means of reducing their taxable income for the year. There has been a design change to the IRS Form 1040, adding again more schedules, whereas before you could just actually put that on the IRS Form 1040. To simplify the IRS Form 1040, they removed some of the lines on the 1040 and created schedules for them. So be aware that as you're walking through your tax return for 2018, it's going to look a little bit different. Eligible taxpayers can use up to 20% 20, 20 of their qualified business income as a tax deduction. Again, it is only applies to income received by uh, that is based out of a trade or business, unless, of course, it was income from a rate or something, uh, something else that is allowable uh, for this particular uh, benefit. Check with your tax advisor again. An addition of up to 10% percent annually for elementary and secondary uh, schools. Uh, distributions from 529 plans um, have been uh, included under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, so um, that's a summary of all the changes that we've talked about. If you, again, uh, want to establish a retirement plan, you can open up an account at Entrust. It's a three-step easy process. Open an account at Entrust, fund an account, and last but not least, uh, instruct us on what type of asset or what type of investment you you are choosing to invest your retirement plan assets to. Very simple process. Uh, set up an account as easy as, as 10 minutes. You can just go to www.theantrustgroup.com, open an account. All right, enough said. Let's uh, open up the lines for any questions you uh, may have in regards to the materials presented. Right. Okay, what happens if an employee is laid off instead of quitting? Well, uh, uh, separation from service uh, in a 401k plan, I'm assuming that that's your question. Separation from service could be voluntary or involuntary. If you separate from service, whether it be voluntary or involuntary, you have reached what we call 
a triggering event or a distributable event. In other words, you can access dollars out of your uh, 401k plan. So uh, late, getting laid off is, is a part of the triggering event uh, scenario uh, in a 401k plan to access 401k dollars. Is taking a capital gains eligible for 20% qualified business income for the sale of real estate? Check with your tax advisor. I believe the, uh, I, I'm not sure about that particular question, um, but if it if it was uh, based of a business, I, I believe that you could. But but if it's not for personal reasons, it's if it's got to be it's got to be income from a trade or a business. But check with your tax advi tax advisor. Um, that. Is the interest on a HELOC deductible if it was used to improve a rental property? I believe if it's for your, because um, uh, HELOCs are typically done for your primary residence. I believe it's for primary residence, but don't quote me on that. Again, that will be a question for your tax advisor as far as interest deductions uh, when it comes to a HELOC. Did you say HELOC is no longer deductible? I didn't say HELOC is no longer deductible for all things, but a HELOC interest generally is no longer deductible if it's not used for if, if the HELOC was not used for your for your residence. In other words, if you use it to pay off credit cards or buy a car, the interest on that HELOC, proportionately, whatever it may be, you may, you may have used a portion of it for your house, a portion of it to for other personal reasons, pay off a credit card as an example, whatever that portion is that that's not used for, for the residents may no longer be used as a tax deduction. Okay. All right. It doesn't seem correct for, for my as a holder of a deed of trust to issue 1098 since interest receives the fund. And I'm not quite sure of that particular question. Um, not, not quite sure about that question. I just want to make sure I've got this right. Uh, right. Section 198 is not for suitable for rents or rental house. That is correct. Uh, rental income uh, for for the 20% um, deduction is not uh, a trade or a business. So therefore, that may not be used for the as as a qualified business income. Can you use money in a self-directed IRA to buy a home for yourself to live in? The answer is no. Uh, self-directed IRAs have what we call prohibited transaction rules under Section 4975 of the Code. So if you are going to use self-directed IRAs to invest, yeah, I would highly recommend to familiarize yourself with the prohibited transaction rules. The IRS does have a section of their website devoted to prohibited transactions. So if you if you type in www.irs.gov under the search functions, type in prohibited transactions, frequently asked questions, FAQ, and you'll be able to um, see in hopefully in layman's terms, uh, hopefully it's layman terms for you, to be able to decipher what is and what isn't a prohibited transaction. But living in a house that your IRA has purchased is a prohibited transaction. Generally, you cannot have a sale a lease, performing services, receiving benefit from an investment inside your IRA uh, personally as a disqualified person. Disqualified persons also include lineal ascendants and lineal descendants. That means parents, grandparents, and descendants would be children, grandchildren, and the spouses of your lineal descendants also cannot benefit from that. So in other words, you cannot buy uh, a property with your IRA and have your son live in it. So... There are prohibited transaction rules. So I kind of extended that, the answer to that question a bit further, but, um, but that's what that means. How is an investor in real estate service uh, affected by educational expenses to perform in said services? Can they be deducted as expenses? I'm not quite sure what that means. How is a, can they use real estate service can they use education to, to study, so on and so forth? If, if that's your question, I'm not quite sure. You might want to talk to your tax advisor to, to, talk, to talk about that particular question a, a bit more, a bit further and be more specific. 
How much do you need to withdraw yearly once you're 71 from a self-directed IRA account? Okay, um, not quite a part of the the the, the uh, presentation, but I'll answer your question anyway. Self-directed IRAs are just any just like any other type of retirement plan, subject to what we call required minimum distribution rules. When a traditional IRA, a SEP IRA, a simple IRA, or maybe even an individual 401k plan participant reaches the age of 70 and a half, once you reach the age of 70 and a half, they have to start taking what we call a minimum amount. And that's what that question was talking about. When you reach, you know, 71, but in this case, actually 70 and a half. When you reach age 70 and a half, you have to take a minimum amount by December 31st of every year. However, only for that first year, you can postpone it to April 1st of the year following, which means that you, if you postpone it, you have two the following year. The amount of the RMD is calculated using a formula. The formula is using the prior year end balance, and you divide that by a life expectancy associated with your age as of your birthday in the year of the calculation called a uniform lifetime table. The IRS has a publication called 590A. If you Google it, 590A, in the back of that, there's what we call the uniform lifetime table. The age that the individual would attain as of their birthday that year is associated with a multiple that is used to divide the prior year ends balance, and that's how you calculate the required minimum distribution for that year. So if you have any further questions on required minimum distributions, give us a call and one of our uh, knowledgeable staff should be able to answer your, your question for you. But that's generally how you calculate it. Can you invest self-directed IRA funds in a corporation? The answer is no. There's a revenue ruling in 1979 that the tax court says grantor trusts, such as an IRA, cannot be a shareholder of an S-corp. So an IRA cannot be a shareholder of an S-corp, so an IRA cannot invest in an S-corp. Uh, what do you charge for an HSA account? Call, call our uh, sales line and one of our service representatives should be able to, to um, answer your question for you on a, on a specific product. Uh, let me see here. What other questions do we have? Uh, does the reverse mortgage interest qualify as a deduction in the new tax law? That's a good question. I'm not quite sure about the answer to that. That's where a competent tax advisor would um, um, come into play. Okay, the 20% deduction from trade or business, is that for Schedule C income? Yes. If you're a sole proprietor and you have a Schedule C, that's your profit and loss statement, your net business income is um, part of the formula to calculate the 20% the, the deduction. Yes, that answers, hope that answers your question. Uh, most webinars I have been listening to say rental property issue usually qualifies for uh, triple net leases do not qualify. Also, my preliminary 2018 tax return software is in, is automatically include, including rentals in the – yeah, that might be something that uh, you might want to take a look at because rental income is typically not included, but – because it's not a trade or a business. The big difference between rental income and other types of incomes is the fact that rental income is not subject to Social Security tax, whereas uh, income from a trade or a business is subject to Social Security tax. In other words, your Schedule SE, because rental income is typically reported on a Schedule E. However, if you report your rental income as part of your self-employment income, well, then... It could qualify for a trade or a business. It really depends upon how you declare that income. But again, talk to your tax advisor. This webinar is not designed for, for as a as a tax advice. It might be something to, good to bring up and uh, and find out. Uh, uh, can I am on the issue by the LLC to one of the shareholders for the administration? And can that amount be used as a 401k contribution? Social Security and Medicare taxes are paid for for this amount by the shareholder. Uh, I'm not quite sure what your question is. If an individual is receiving 1099 income and they are reporting that on a Schedule C as a self-employed individual, the self-employed income can be used as a means of making a contribution for that self-employed uh, 401k plan because the individual does not receive a W-2, as an example. 
Only the income for self-employment can be used as a basis of making a contribution to a 401k plan that they establish as a business. It can also be a SEP contribution or it can also be a simple contribution. I hope that answers your question. Uh, can educational expenses incurred to learn how to invest in real estate services be deducted on taxes as expenses? Uh, something you might want to run by your tax advisor. Not quite sure what, what that would be. Okay. How much can I withdraw? Here we go. How, it's, a tax, uh, it's a retirement related question. How much can I withdraw tax free from interest account? that holds my rent, rental house once I turn 59 and a half. Well, if it's a traditional IRA, you cannot distribute tax-free. You may distribute penalty-free, but you cannot distribute tax-free. The only type of IRA that you can distribute tax-free is what we call a Roth IRA. If you have a Roth IRA, the earnings on a Roth IRA are distributed tax-free once you reach uh, age 59 and a half, death or disability, as well as you've had a Roth for five years. But in traditional IRAs, you can never distribute tax-free. You will be, you'll, you'll be distributing penalty-free, but not tax-free. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, it also also does entrance automatically set checks for the RMD clients when they reach a, the age where it's required or do we have to call and request it? Uh, you would have to call and request it because uh, the, the taxpayer is actually allowed to distribute their RMD from any IRA that they have. So we don't know whether or not you want to satisfy from the entrance group so we don't send the checks automatically. But there is a notice that is sent on January 31st of the year for which you have an RMD due. So in other words, by January 31st of this year, if you're required to take out an RMD, then that amount will be provided to you, but you would still have to request it to be distributed by December 31st. How much can I withdraw penalty-free from... Uh, Okay, well, it depends upon the amount that you're distributing from an uh, IRA that is uh, exempt from a, a penalty. Uh, as an example, I, I don't know if that's, if that's if you're dealing mainly with a medical thing, or there are several exemptions to the 10% penalty. Death, disability, attainment of 59 and a half, education expenses for, for um, uh, higher level education, college, university. It's still going to get taxed, but it'll be penalty-free. Um, conversions are exempt from penalty. Uh, distributing for health insurance purposes, if you wanted to distribute from your IRA for to maintain to continue your COBRA payments, there is a list of exemptions to the 10% penalty, and the amount that is associated with that exemption is the amount that can be distributed penalty-free, if that was your question. Uh, if you have real estate and a self-directed IRA, what's the best way to leave this to your children? Is it, is, the best, is it best to divide the IRA into their names at your death or leave it in your living trust? Uh, it's really up to you. Um, it, it, you know, it's best to seek first the assistance of a competent legal advisor. If you name multiple beneficiaries under your IRA, the proportionate share of percentages will be divided up to the beneficiaries upon your death. So it's really uh, it's really uh, a loaded question that you ask because um, there are other factors to to uh, consider, such as is your is the corpus of your estate subject to estate taxes? Right, and we can't answer that. That will be something that you're competent estate planner. Would it be better to leave it to your children, or are you married? Would it be better to leave it to your spouse? Uh, those are, are estate planning questions that may be best suited to uh, be answered by a competent estate planner. But can you leave your self-directed IRA to multiple beneficiaries? Yes, you can name beneficiaries under the beneficiary designation form of your IRA. And if it's a piece of real estate, it can be divided up based on the percentage. Of course, there will be fees to your beneficiaries upon your death to re-record those proportionate shares based on what we call uh, an inherited IRA re-registration of the account. So if the particular piece of property is going to have to be re-registered, there's additional fees. But you can leave 
a portion of a, a piece of real estate. And the, and the it, it could create a stream of payments to the beneficiaries called required minimum distributions based out of the life expectancy of the beneficiaries, which could be a lifelong uh, distribution of those assets to the beneficiaries if the property is a rental property, as an example. Um, how can we transfer a self-directed IRA uninvested from another custodian to the interest group? Ah, that's very easy. Uh, call one of our customer service reps, uh, establish an IRA, and then from there request uh, for a transfer of your IRA from another institution to the interest group via what we call a transfer form. They will ask for a statement from your prior custodian, and then from there those assets can be transferred to the interest group. Again, it can all be answered uh, through our 800 line. Okay. Um, let's see here. Do you monitor Roth IRAs? No, we do not. Um, as a self-directed custodian, all the services that we're offering is basically taking custody of the assets to keep the assets tax-deferred. But in a self-directed IRA, all the honest of, of doing due diligence, vetting out the investment is done by the taxpayer. And that's one of the biggest benefits of a self-directed IRA. And it also could be the biggest detriment of an, uh, of an IRA because there are no there is no investment advice provided by a self-directed IRA administrator because all we're doing is administering the account to keep the real piece of um, property tax deferred. So if you're asking, do we monitor Roth IRAs from a perspective of an investment? No, we do not. Do we keep track of the rules so that when distributions are distributed, uh, we report it accordingly, whether it be tax-free or not tax-free? Yes, we do. That would be something that we would do. But as far as the investment is concerned, we do not monitor it. Monitor it. Is cash held in an interest account paying an interest? The answer is no. The cash account in an interest uh, self-directed account is under a uh, non-interest bearing account, um, and therefore uh, those assets do not earn interest. Um, <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, well, it's 12.14, and that kind of ends our time for this particular seminar. My name is John Paul Ruiz, uh, Director of Professional Development here at uh, the Entrust Group. And um, we covered quite a, a bit of information. If you have any further detail or further specific questions, again, please contact your competent legal or tax advisor. In regards to your specific questions, um, we don't claim to be an expert at taxation, but this is just to raise up uh, the information for you to be able to make an informed uh, conversation with your competent tax or legal advisor. We thank you again for attending today's seminar, and uh, we look forward to having you again in a future Entrust uh, seminar. Thank you, and have a great day.